Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, getting into something really popular for you tech tinkerers out there, building your own home lab. Yeah, that personal tech playground idea. It's fantastic. Totally. A place where you can experiment, optimize, really make it your own. And for a lot of you, Proxmox Virtual Environment, or VE, seems to be the platform of choice for VMs and containers. It really is. Powerful stuff, open source. It's a solid pick for virtualization. But uh, as many find out, when you try to level up, maybe cluster two Proxmox nodes together, that's where things can get a little... A bit dicey, yeah. yeah. That quorum system, which is there to keep everything synced up and you know prevent chaos, with just two nodes, it often feels like, well, like there's a piece missing from the puzzle. Right. We see that struggle popping up online all the time. Alex, one of the listeners who shared their notes, really put a finger on a key question. Mm -hmm. Can you use that PFS Emir expected one command to keep a two node cluster going if one node drops? And like, does that setting actually stick around? Ah, the million dollar question. Exactly. And spoiler alert. It's uh, not quite the magic bullet people hope for. So that's kind of our mission for this deep dive, isn't it? To unpack the secrets to getting a two-node Proxmox cluster running smoothly. Yep. We're digging into community insights, our own analysis, the whole shebang. And for many home setups. Yeah. You know, like Alex's scenario. Home gear, single switch, shared NFS storage on a NAS. Yeah, typical home lab stuff. Right. The goal isn't usually like, corporate level bulletproof high availability it's more about the convenience maybe the cool factor definitely managing everything from one place maybe migrating workloads easily that's the dream but what tripped alex up and so many others is that core problem quorum maybe you can walk us through that what is quorum and why is it such a headache specifically for two nodes sure so quorum is basically the mechanism that ensures all the nodes in your cluster agree on what's happening on the cluster's state super important yeah Absolutely critical. It stops things like data corruption or uh, the split brain scenarios we hear about. Where nodes kind of go rogue. Exactly. Operating independently, potentially messing things up badly. Now for a two node Proxmox cluster, the system by default expects both nodes to be online to have quorum. That's two votes needed. Okay, so two votes needed out of two possible votes. Right, so if one node goes down, poof you lose quorum. And that's the key problem. That's the kicker, because VMs on the remaining healthy node might refuse to start or even stop functioning correctly. That's exactly what Alex ran into. Okay, so quorum's the hurdle, and Alex was wondering about that PVETS me expected one command as a way over it. Yeah, seemed like a straightforward fix, right? Just tell the cluster you only expect one node, does it work, and does it last? Well, the answer we found in the discussions was interesting. It may be a bit deflating for some. Uh oh. Yes. Running PVSCVS expected one can bring a cluster back online if one node is already down. So it has its uses. Okay. So it can work in that specific situation. But in this is the bigger PVS, but it is absolutely not persistent. Ah, it doesn't stick. No. By design, actually. Proxmox treats it as a temporary override. Think of it like um, the spare tire for your cluster. Handy in an emergency, but you wouldn't drive cross country on it. Exactly. As soon as that second node comes back online and rejoins the cluster, the expected votes automatically resets back to two. Okay. And it doesn't survive a reboot either. You'd have to run the command again. So you can't just set it and forget it. Definitely not. And what's more, if you try to run PVS Heat Me Expected 1 while both nodes are happily running online. Let me guess. Proxmox says nope. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. It'll throw an error. Again, by design, it's trying to protect your data integrity, stopping you from potentially putting the cluster into a dangerous state intentionally. So for Alex, this command wasn't the simple permanent fix they were hoping for. Not at all. It's a temporary patch, not a configuration setting you can rely on. Right. Which leads us nicely, or maybe not so nicely, to the split brain monster. Ooh, sounds ominous. It is. It's a term that genuinely seems to haunt cluster enthusiasts, and, well, for very good reason. What exactly is split brain? Why is it the boogeyman here? So split brain is what can happen when, say, the network connection between your two nodes breaks. Okay. Both nodes are still running, but they can't talk to each other anymore. Yeah. Each one might think it's the only one left or that the other one is down. And they both carry on independently. Precisely. And here's the nightmare fuel. Mm -hmm. If they're both connected to the same shared storage, uh -oh. they might both try to write data. 
potentially conflicting data to the same place at the same time. Oh, wow. Okay. Like two chefs in one kitchen, you mentioned. Yeah, that analogy works well. Each thinks they're in charge, cooking different meals with the same ingredients. It's a recipe for disaster. And the disaster in your Proxmox cluster means corrupted VMs, damaged storage, basically turning your fun home lab project into a recovery nightmare. Exactly that. And the warnings from the community discussions were really stark on this point. People were pretty clear. Very clear. Someone compared running a two-node cluster without proper quorum handling to RAID 0. Ouch. For listeners, RAID 0 stripes data across disks for speed, but if one disk fails, you lose it everything. Right. So the analogy is it doubles your risk of catastrophic failure, essentially. Oh. If either node hiccups, the whole thing might stall because it loses quorum. Wow. Another user just said flat out, don't do it because you will get split brain. No mincing words there. Doesn't sound like something you want to gamble with. No. The consensus was that manually lowering the expected quorum to one might keep things technically running if a node fails, but it's like I don't know, disabling your car's airbags because they might deploy accidentally. You're removing a critical safety feature for perceived convenience, but risking total data loss. Precisely. It's a gamble with your data integrity. Not recommended. Okay, so PFSME expected one is out as a permanent fix. Split brain is terrifying. But what is the actual solution? The community seemed pretty united on something. You really did. The answer that came up again and again was use a Q device. A Q device. Okay, what is that? It stands for quorum device. It's essentially a lightweight third voter in your cluster election. So instead of just two nodes voting, you add a third entity. Exactly. But critically, it doesn't need to be a full, powerful Proxmox node. It can be something much simpler. Like what, what kind of things can act as a Q device? The suggestions were pretty varied. People mentioned using something as small as a Raspberry Pi Zero. Wow, really? That tiny? Yep. Or even just a small Linux virtual machine running somewhere else. Maybe on your NAS, if it has enough spare resources. As long as it's separate from the two main Proxmox nodes themselves. That's the key requirement. It uh. needs to be on a separate physical device or at least running independently so it doesn't go down if one of the main nodes does. So people suggested a VM on the NAS, maybe if you have enough RAM. Or like a dedicated Pi Zero, which is super cheap. Yeah, those are the popular easy fixes. Cheap and effective. Okay, that sounds much more promising. <laughs> How does this Q device actually prevent the problems we've been talking about? Well, think about the quorum rule again. Proxmox needs a majority of votes to stay active. Right. With two nodes, that majority was two. But now you have three potential voters. Node one, node two and the Q device. Ah, so the majority needed is now two out of three. Exactly. So if one of your main Proxmox nodes goes offline, you still have two votes remaining, the healthy node and the Q device. And two out of three is a majority. Correct. So the cluster stays core rate, stays online, and keeps functioning. The remaining node knows it has permission to run. And that neatly avoids the split brain problem too, right? Because only the side with quorum, two votes, can actually operate. Precisely. It acts as a tiebreaker. Only one partition of the cluster, if the network splits, can achieve quorum, ensuring only one side remains active and preventing conflicting rights. Okay, let's maybe peek behind the curtain a bit. Why does Proxmox work this way, and why is the Q device the recommended solution? Sure. So Proxmox VD is built on Debian Linux, and for its clustering, it uses a system called the Corusync Cluster Engine. Corusync, right. Heard of it. And Corusync fundamentally relies on this concept of quorum to keep everything consistent. The default two-node setup, as we've established, is just inherently brittle without that third vote. It's just the maths of needing a majority. Pretty much. Oh. And the key device provides that third vote cleanly. In fact, Proxmox's own official documentation recommends setting up a queue device, specifically using the PEV device package, as the proper way to stabilize a two-node cluster. So it's not just a community hack, it's the blessed method. It is. It's the officially sanctioned approach for this scenario. And you mentioned it's lightweight. That's a big plus for home labs, I imagine. Huge plus. The resource requirements are minimal. We're talking maybe 512 megabytes of RAM and just a basic Linux installation. Tiny. Yeah. So the appeal for home labbers is obvious. It's simple. It's incredibly cost effective. You know, Raspberry Pi Zero costs, what, maybe $15? Peanuts, really, in the context of server hardware. Right. And you can probably get it set up in less than an hour following the Proxmox guides. Or, like we said, use a spare VM on your NAS if you have one. Makes total sense. Were there any other, maybe more adventurous options mentioned? There was one user who suggested trying to run a third Proxmox node, but inside a VM. Whoa, okay. 
A virtualized Proxmox node acting as the third vote. Yeah, it's possible, but definitely more complex. Needs more resources, obviously, and you have to be really careful with the networking setup to make sure you don't accidentally create new single points of failure. Right, like if the storage holding that VM goes down or the network path to it. Exactly. So queue device is generally the much simpler recommended route. What about Alex's single switch? We mentioned that earlier. Does adding a queue device change anything there? Is it still okay for a home use? Generally, yes. A single switch is fine for a typical home lab, even with a queue device setup. It works yeah. perfectly well. I sense a butt. Well, it is technically a single point of failure, right? Mm -hmm. If that one switch dies, your nodes lose connectivity, your queue device might lose connectivity. Everything goes dark. Potentially, yeah. So if you're aiming for maximum uptime, you look at adding a second switch, maybe some redundant network cards, NACs, in your nodes. Leveling up the redundancy. Exactly. But for most home setups, where maybe a little downtime isn't the end of the world, a single switch is usually a reasonable compromise for budget and simplicity. The risk is often low enough. Okay. Now, despite the queue device solution sounding pretty solid, not everyone in the discussions was actually sold on clustering at all for a small home lab. That's true. There was definitely another perspective shared. What was the alternative? One user basically threw a curveball and said, just don't cluster the nodes. Run them completely independently. Yep. Run them as two separate Proxmox installations. Their argument was that trying to cluster just two nodes, especially without a queue device, often ends up creating more headaches than it actually solves for a small setup like Alex's. Interesting, so skip the complexity altogether. Right, if the main desire was just easier management, they pointed towards something called Proxmox Data Center Management, or PDM. PDM. It's a tool Proxmox is developing for centralized management of multiple nodes without needing a full cluster setup. Oh, okay, so you get a single pane of glass, maybe, but without the quorum issues. That seems to be the idea. However, the big caveat mentioned was that PDM is still considered alpha software. Ah. So bleeding edge, not quite ready for prime time. Definitely not stable or recommended for critical use yet. Something to maybe keep an eye on for the future, but not a solution for today. Gotcha. So it sounds like for many, the feeling was clustering two nodes is, well, it's kind of neat. It's fun, maybe. Yeah, there's a definite cool factor for some home labbers. But you really need to weigh that thrill, that desire for the setup, yeah. against the actual risks and potential hassle, especially yeah. if you don't use a queue device. Precisely. It's about being pragmatic, understanding split brain, understanding quorum, and then either implementing that queue device correctly or maybe deciding, you know what, two separate nodes is simpler for me. Keeping the adventure fun without constant troubleshooting headaches. That's the goal. Okay, this has been super insightful, so let's try and distill all this down. For you listening, if you're looking at setting up your own two-node Proxmox cluster, what are the concrete practical steps to success? All right, let's make an action plan based on everything we've discussed from the community and the docs. Lay it on us. First, and most importantly, add a queue device for guaranteed stability. Seriously, this is the key takeaway. Right. Set it up on a Pi or a VM on your NAS. Exactly. Follow the Proxmox documentation for PV device. Get mm -hmm. that third vote in place. Mm -hmm. It ensures quorum even if one node fails. And crucially, it prevents those split brain nightmares. Okay. Step one, Q device. What's next? Step two, avoid PV Vessimi expected one as any kind of permanent solution. Use it only as that temporary spare tire. Precisely. Mm -hmm. If you need to bring the cluster up when a node is already down, fine but don't rely on it. It's not persistent, it resets, it's not meant for long-term use. Got it, don't use the hack long-term. What if clustering, even with a queue device, just feels like overkill? Then step three, consider running independent nodes. If the complexity or potential failure points of a cluster were you, just manage your two Proxmox hosts separately via their web interfaces. Simplifies things massively, avoids all the quorum stuff. Totally, sometimes simpler is better. Okay, and looking ahead. Step four, explore PDM, but cautiously. Keep an eye on Proxmox data center management if centralized management without clustering appeals to you. But remember, it's still alpha, not ready yet. Watch the space, basically. And the final step, pr probably the most important, regardless of setup. Absolutely. Step five, non-negotiable. Back up, back up, back up. Can't say enough. Seriously. Whatever you do, cluster, no cluster, queue device, independent nodes, make sure you have regular, reliable backups going to your NAS or some other secure storage. Proxmox has built-in tools for that, right? It does. They're pretty good. Makes it relatively easy. Your backups are your ultimate safety net if things go sideways. No excuses on this one. That's a really solid action plan. Queue device, 
avoid the hack, consider going solo, watch PDM, and always back up. Sums it up well. It really sounds like, yeah, setting up a two-node Proxmox cluster has its hurdles. Definitely some challenges to get your head around. It does. But the satisfaction, the thrill of actually mastering it and getting it running reliably, that seems worth the effort for many. I think so too. And the path forward seems pretty clear now, thanks to those community discussions. You either embrace the Q device for real stability, or you steer clear of the risky quorum hacks and maybe rethink if clustering is even what you need for your home lab goals. Exactly. It's about finding that balance, yeah. right, between the ambition to build something cool and the pragmatism to build something reliable. Understanding the limits, planning carefully. For Alex and for anyone else venturing down this path, getting that balance right means you can have a setup that's both fun to tinker with and actually works when you need it. Absolutely. And maybe here's a final thought for you to chew on as you work on your own lab. Ooh, okay. How does really understanding these core principles, core arm, split brain, the role of a Q device, how does that empower you beyond just configuring this one specific setup? Ah, like how does it change how you approach other things? Yeah. How does it help you troubleshoot better, maybe scale your lab differently later, or even just innovate more confidently within your own tech playground? What other experiments could you now tackle knowing you've got these fundamentals down? 